This will be the first lecture on diabetes mellitus. Um, here we're going to look at the definition of diabetes and the, and the uh, specific diagnostic criteria. And then uh, I'll discuss the different types of diabetes, di type 1, type 2, a type called LADA and MODI, a little bit about gestational diabetes and some other less common types. And then I'll end the lecture uh, talking about insulin resistance and how that is sort of a, it's a pre-diabetes state and how we're seeing a bit of an epidemic of that. So um, that'll be the topics for this video. The next video, we'll talk a bit about the complications, the basic assessment and treatment of diabetes mellitus. So diabetes mellitus is defined as a relative or absolute lack of insulin uh, leading to hyperglycemia. Um, and uh, remember, insulin is a uh, peptide hormone secreted by the beta cells in the islets of Langerhans and the pancreas. Uh, and its main action is primarily to serve as an anabolic hormone in the body. So just quickly to summarize the actions of insulin again. Again, uh, basically it's going to stimulate the uptake of glucose into cells, specifically those with, um, that uh, require glucose or glucose dependent, or I'm sorry, insulin dependent glucose transporters. That would be the GLUT2 transporters. And uh, those are found primarily in uh, muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells, and uh, adipose tissue. And uh, in those tissues and the liver, remember the liver actually doesn't need insulin to get glucose into it, but insulin has uh, a lot of functions to stimulate anabolism, such as glycogen synthesis and storage in liver and muscle, uh, triglyceride synthesis and storage in liver and adipose tissue, amino acid uptake into cells and increased protein synthesis, especially in muscles. Um, it tends to, insulin will decrease uh, glucagon release. Glucagon, remember, is the other peptide hormone, major peptide hormone from the islets of Langerhans that opposes the action of insulin. Um, decreases proteolysis, decreases lipolysis, decreases the production of new glucose via gluconeogenesis, uh, decreases the breakdown of glycogen via glycogenolysis, and decreases cellular autophagy. So uh, that actually is a potentially negative effect of high insulin states in that cells normally need to recycle their constituents. That's that process of autophagy. Um, but insulin uh, tends to inhibit that, especially uh, high insulin states. Uh, insulin has an effect on increasing stomach acid as well as uh, the cell uptake of potassium. Uh, and remember that a treatment for hyperkalemia um, is essentially to give insulin and that drives the potassium back into the cells. Um, increases uh, the sodium reuptake via the kidneys. Uh, insulin has a, a minor vasodilatory effect. Uh, and in the brain, we know it's important for supporting the glial cells as well as neurons via non-glucose um, dependent ways. And that's to improve learning and memory and uh, it tends to also somewhat increase gonadotropin releasing hormone which would increase fertility that's remember a, um, a hypothalamic hormone which is going to stimulate the pituitary to release lh or fsh which will regulate estrogen and progesterone uh, unlike glucose insulin will not because it's a fairly large peptide hormone will not cross the placenta okay so that's the basic actions of insulin again an anabolic hormone um, the two basic types of diabetes would be type 1, which basically is a uh, deficiency of insulin, usually due to autoimmune destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas. Um, much more common is type 2 diabetes, and that is insulin resistance. Um, and typically in the um, early to mid stages of, of type 2 diabetes, the pancreas actually over secretes insulin to try to stimulate the cells to take up more uh, uh, glucose. So we can think of type 2 diabetes actually as an insulin excess state. Type 1 is more of an insulin deficiency state. But the net result at the cell level is the same. The cells essentially are not uh, affected by insulin like they should. The incidence of diabetes, especially type 2, is growing. Uh, about 135 million people worldwide have type 2 diabetes, about 20 million in the U.S. Uh, that was as of a couple of years ago. Um, in uh, maybe 2018, I believe those statistics come from. Uh, so classic symptoms um, of diabetes are going to be more pronounced in type 1. Type 2 presents quite differently, and we'll talk about that. But type 1 has the classic polydipsia, um, polyphagia, polyuria, and weight loss. Remember, polydipsia is increased thirst, polyphagia increased hunger, polyuria increased urination, and weight loss. 
Um, if left untreated, type 1 diabetes is uh, fatal, typically because of the development of diabetic ketoacidosis, and so we'll talk about that. Um, type 2 diabetes has much slower, more chronic complications related to retinopathy, nephropathy, which is damage to the nephrons in the kidneys, neuropathy, and then cardiovascular complications. So one of the main factors, uh, risk factors in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease actually is diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes. Um, we have guidelines for uh, the definition as well as the basic treatments that come to us from the American Diabetes Association. So this is the source of the guidelines that I'll be discussing in the notes. Um, be sure to differentiate diabetes mellitus from diabetes insipidus. So there's another type of diabetes much more rare, um, which is due to lack uh, or relative lack in sensitivity, for example, at the kidneys of antidiuretic hormone. This is a pituitary hormone. Of course, it's also called arginine vasopressin or just vasopressin uh, secreted by the posterior pituitary. Um, and this is, has nothing to do with gl blood glucose, um, but it causes symptoms similar to type 1 diabetes uh, with polyuria, polydipsia in particular. Um, but, uh, but again, that has nothing to do with diabetes mellitus. The word mellitus comes from honey, and this was when physicians used to actually taste the urine of patients to diagnose. And um, sweet honey-tasting urine, uh, the patient was diagnosed with diabetes mellitus. But if they had these kind of symptoms and the urine was not sweet, then it's diabetes insipidus. Okay, what are the diagnostic criteria for diabetes? Uh, the American Di uh, Diabetes Association has the following uh, sort of uh, recommendations in terms of testing. So one of our main blood tests for especially type 2 diabetes will be our hemoglobin A1C. And uh, remember hemoglobin A1C is hemoglobin that has been glycosylated. And so the higher your blood sugar, uh, has been over the last three months, the higher the percentage of glycosylated hemoglobin. So this is expressed as a percentage and uh, anything over equal to, or over to 6.5%. Um, usually we need two confirmatory values, but typically we would just start with one. If it's over 6.5%, then that has a high likelihood that's, that meets the criteria actually of diabetes. Um, the fasting blood glucose can also be used after an eight hour fast and if it's equal or greater to 126 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, again, this one is best to have two, even three consecutive measurements. Um, or if a oral glucose tolerance test is done where a person ingests a uh, bolus of glucose, it's 75 grams of anhydrous glucose dissolved in water, and then we measure their blood glucose after two hours. If it's over equal to or over 200 milligrams per deciliter, that also meets the criteria for diabetes. Uh, the last would be a non-fasting glucose of over 200, um, plus the clinical signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia or a hyperglycemic crisis, which we'll be talking about later. Um, so those are the different uh, ways we can test for diabetes. The most common would be the first two, the A1C and the fasting plasma glucose. Um, generally with uh, retesting, we retest patients that we have uh, diagnosed with uh, uh, diabetes at re fairly regular intervals, but if the uh, fasting blood glucose is less than 100 milligrams per deciliter or the A1C is less than 5.7, we generally retest within two to three years. That's the ADA recommendation. A lot of clinicians, especially if we suspect insulin resistance and whatnot might retest a lot sooner. Uh, generally, we retest every one to two years if the fasting blood glucose is 100 to 125 or the A1C is between 5.7 and 6.4. These are important numbers. That essentially is what we call prediabetes. So prediabetes is A1C between 5.7 and 6.4 or a fasting plasma glucose of 100 to 125. Um, so keep those numbers in mind. But as soon as we get to an A1C of 6.5 or over, or over 126, uh, equal to over to 126 on the fasting blood glucose, then we have actual diabetes. Um, just as a little remark on who we should screen for diabetes, any patient, adult patient with hypertension and hyperlipidemia should be screened for diabetes or insulin resistance. Um, those between 40 and 70 years old with a BMI of 25 or greater and any 
patients with signs or symptoms of hyperglycemia. So those are the general guidelines in terms of who should get initial screening. It's pretty common practice for most patients. They present to the doctor for, let's say, a yearly checkup to get their blood tests and whatnot to uh, just order an A1C at that time. Um, remember that the fasting plasma glucose will be found on the complete metabolic panel. So it's one of the measures in the CMP. Uh, again, if the CMP is done fasting, we can get the fasting blood glucose from that. Okay, so that's the diagnostic criteria and retesting and screening uh, criteria for diabetes. So let me talk first about type 1 diabetes. It's typically abbreviated DM1. Um, you also see kind of an older acronym, and that's IDDM, which is Insulin Dependent Diabetes Mellitus. Uh, some people uh, in some older sources used to call this juvenile diabetes, but we don't use that term anymore because uh, we're seeing uh, adults or late teens and whatnot develop this, and uh, so juvenile doesn't really apply to this. Um, this uh, results from an absolute deficiency of insulin due to autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cells and the islets become infiltrated with T cells. Um, interestingly, there are stem cells there in the pancreas. Also, they come from the bone marrow. And uh, if that immune response stopped, the pancreas would actually potentially regenerate and the beta cells would regenerate. So we do see some patients with type one diabetes. They've been on insulin for years. Suddenly the insulin uh, starts to give them severe hypoglycemia. We take them off the insulin and they actually can normalize their blood sugar without the need for any insulin. So I've had a couple of cases of that. It's in the literature. Uh, it's not typical though. Um, and uh, what I've seen in those patients, two of them in particular, uh, 10 years later, 10, 15 years later, they were maybe in an auto accident or some sort of trauma and that reinitiated the autoimmune response. And so they required insulin again after that. Um, one of the ways we can confirm type 1 diabetes is uh, to measure pancreatic autoantibodies in the blood, and I'll talk about those here in a bit. Um, over time, unfortunately, with all that increased immune destruction, the islet cells become fibrosed and they begin to atrophy. Um, so basically, type 1 diabetes patients will require insulin. Um, now, insulin resistance can also develop with type 1 patients. Um, and with current insulin therapy, about 20 to 30% of type 1 patients actually develop insulin resistance and, uh, uh, and uh, they actually are overweight and obese as well. So this is um, something I'll talk about later with insulin resistance. Importantly, not all patients with uh, obesity are insulin resistant. We have cases of insulin resistance in very thin patients. And so uh, body weight is not the only factor there. Um, type 1 diabetes accounts for about 5 to 10 percent, according to the CDC in 2019, of all different types of diabetes. So not very common, but it has the most severe uh, complications if not addressed appropriately. Uh, most cases appear before the age of 20, but again, as I mentioned, they can occur at any age and uh, occurs most often in those of Northern European ancestry. Um, the genetics, we see that type 1 tends to run in families, but the familial connection is a lot weaker than with type 2 diabetes. So type 2 has a stronger genetic component than type 1, interestingly. So we think there's spontaneous mutations or damage, uh, and uh, this is what triggers the autoimmune uh, activation and then the consequent uh, destruction of beta cells. Uh, there's about a 50% concordance for the development of type 1, in identical twins versus with type two, it's between 90 and 100% uh, uh, between uh, identical twins. Both twins will develop type two diabetes, but only 50% with um, identical twin studies. Um, often type one is diagnosed early in life. This is the most typical presentation when a, a child or adolescent develops diabetic ketoacidosis, which lands them in the emergency room and um, then they're diagnosed with diabetes at that point. Uh, we'll talk about diabetic ketoacidosis in the complication section, but basically with any acidosis, you're gonna have rapid Kussmaul respirations in order to ventilate out carbon dioxide to try to lower the blood pH, uh, mental disorientation, and potentially even coma. Um, and this has to do with the buildup of uh, excess ketones. Basically, this patient this person can no longer get glucose into their muscle or adipose tissue, so they start burning fats for energy. And all that uh, fat, the acetyl-CoA in the liver is converted to ketone bodies, 
So they go into a state of ketosis, which then goes into uh, ketoacidosis. And uh, so we call this diabetic ketoacidosis. Again, it can be fatal, uh, but this is often one of the first presentations that might uh, bring the patient to seek attention, medical attention. Um, elevated glucose, uh, anything pretty much over 100, uh, uh, 160 milligrams per deciliter, you can say up to 180, um, in that range will spill over into the urine causing the uh, frequent urination. Um, and so that would be polydipsia and that would create frequent thirst, poly, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, hunger because you're basically losing calories uh, from all that glucose spilling. So there'll be hunger, increased hunger, polyphagia, polyuria, increased urination, and then the weight loss. So type one patients tend to get very thin, very cachexic looking uh, before they are stabilized with insulin. That's sort of opposite of type two. Type two patients tend to be more, typically more on the heavier side. Again, there's some patients who are on the more thin side with type two diabetes, but it's typically more associated with being overweight or with obesity. Um, the diagnosis for type one would require increased blood glucose. I just went over those criteria in the last slide. I won't repeat that. Uh, decreased insulin, and uh, as we'll see, um, usually, uh, and I talked about this in the insulin section of the pancreas, um, you know, insulin is co-secreted with C-peptide. And uh, C-peptide is a marker really for insulin levels. And so we sometimes measure C-peptide instead of insulin as a more accurate marker of the insulin levels. But it'd be decreased insulin or C-peptide, and then an increase in pancreatic autoantibodies. Usually we only measure two or three of these autoantibodies. The most typical ones would be islet cell autoantibodies, ICA, the anti-glutamic acid decarboxylase antibodies, GAD65, the insulin antibodies. Uh, so those would probably be the most common, these first three. And then less common would be uh, tyrosine phosphatase antibodies uh, in an insulinoma, which is a tumor of the beta cells where they oversecrete insulin. There is elevations of a specific protein, IA2. And then uh, we can also see antibodies against uh, the zinc transporter in type 1 diabetes. Uh, so there's, that's, that would be a, another set of antibodies. But again, the first three are the typical ones when you order an autoimmune pancreatic panel, they typically include those three or even just the first two. Um, now the absence of pancreatic autoantibodies does not rule out type 1 diabetes because sometimes this test is just not sensitive enough. Um, and uh, we can also see that the antibody elevation will precede the actual symptom development by months or years. So we don't routinely just measure these antibodies, but in some patients that I've had that suspicion I have, and they've actually had elevated antibodies and that kind of uh, alerted us that they were uh, starting that autoimmune process, um, which um, you know we, we could at that point address. Um, so the treatment really requires exogenous insulin. And uh, this is either through, remember insulin's a peptide, so it can't be taken orally. It has to be taken typically with injection, subcutaneously in the belly fat or elsewhere. Um, and more and more commonly now there are insulin pumps and I'll talk about those in the insulin section, but these can deliver insulin continuously throughout the day. Um, and a little, uh, we're sort of the next step in that technology is gonna to be to actually have uh, what they call continuous reading insulin pumps where the glucose sensors are embedded in the body. They're able to detect the glucose levels and then adjust the insulin directly so that a patient doesn't have to calculate you know, with their meals, uh, how much they ate and how much insulin they should take and so forth. So uh, we'll talk about insulin therapy, but that's the treatment for type one. Now supportive therapies, uh, all of that, maybe uh, therapies to improve insulin resistance could be helpful in some patients, but primarily we need, uh, definitely we need insulin replacement therapy. Now type two diabetes, uh, DM2, again, an older acronym is NIDDM, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. This is much more common, and this results from peripheral insulin resistance, typically in skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. And this accounts for up to 90, 90 to 95% of all diabetes, according to the CDC. Um, the prevalence in the US is around 8%, but in populations over 65, it's as high as 25%. It's more common in Native American, Hispanic American, and African American populations in the US, and uh, it's higher in all populations around the world consuming a Western diet. So we see that when Western diets replace the 
native diets in a lot of places that the incidence of type 2 diabetes skyrockets. Um, this is a good example of in China, we're seeing, uh, you know, the older literature used to describe primarily type 1 diabetes. So there's a name for diabetes called Xiaoka in Chinese medicine, uh, wasting and thirsting disease. And uh, this primarily describes type 1. Um, and that was what's in most of the Chinese literature. In the last couple decades, there's been an explosion of type 2 diabetes in China, and that really has not been addressed in the classical herbal literature. Um, but now there's uh, people that are working on new pattern uh, characterizations based on that knowledge. Um, usually there's, again, a strong familial onset or component. Um, the identical twin story, uh, studies show a 90 to 100% concordance with genetic factors. And um, most cases are also associated with obesity. So that's about 80%. Notice that's not 100. Uh, but we think also inflammation, aging, again, the genetic factors. And uh, we often see this coupled with hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and abdominal obesity. And that gives us what's called metabolic syndrome. So I'll talk about what is the definition of metabolic syndrome, but many people have uh, metabolic syndrome. Typically they will have prediabetes, which can actually progress into uh, full-blown diabetes with time. Um, more children, teens, and young adults are now developing type two. So again, we used to call this adult onset or juvenile, non-juvenile onset, but we're seeing now 13 year olds, 14 year olds developing type two diabetes. Um, insulin resistance, again, is associated with prediabetes or dysglycemia, and that's, again, an elevated fasting glucose between 100 and 126. Uh, it's actually up to 125. Uh, after at 126 or over, you are technically in the diabetes range. Um, and an elevated A1C between 5.7 and 6.4%. Um, prediabetes often precedes full-blown type 2 diabetes by years or even decades. And uh, what happens in this case is the pancreas will hypersecrete insulin, causing hyperinsulinemia to get the cells to respond to insulin. Um, eventually though, the beta cells become exhausted and the insulin uh, secretion declines. The beta cells are gradually replaced with amyloid protein and um, the beta cell mass uh, undergoes atrophy. So in autopsy studies, they found a 50% reduction in beta cell mass in type 2 diabetes patients. Um, patients will eventually need insulin therapy. So uh, it's not true that type 2 doesn't need insulin therapy. It's just that usually in the early stages, uh, we can use agents to improve insulin resistance. We can encourage lifestyle diet modifications to work with that. Uh, but in the later stages, they often will need uh, insulin therapy. Um, now, although less common than in type 1 diabetes, um, you can, a patient can develop diabetic ketoacidosis in type 2 diabetes. But that's pretty rare that we hear that. And you know, maybe in the more advanced cases when the patient actually needs insulin in late stage type 2, we'll see that more. Um, but it's, it's, it's still possible. Uh, the most significant long-term complication though of type two is cardiovascular disease. And that's gonna be at the microvascular level, that would be the arterioles and capillary level, or the macrovascular level at the arteries themselves. Um, and uh, so we'll see that there's an increased risk of coronary artery disease, stroke. Um, the damage to capillary beds is gonna damage the retina, cause damage to the kidneys, cause damage to the nerves in the periphery, causing peripheral neuropathy, um, and uh, potentially uh, decreasing circulation into the limbs, uh, and those tissues will start to uh, infarct and uh, become gangrenous. Um, so that is um, the, the big concern, is the correlation there with cardiovascular disease. So we can almost talk about diabetes, especially type two, is actually being a type of cardiovascular disease, really. Um, the diagnosis criteria will have increased blood glucose according to the ADA criteria I gave previously. Uh, the insulin in this case is going to be either normal or elevated. Uh, maybe in late stages it'll be depressed. Um, there'll be no pancreatic autoantibodies. So um, if the antibodies are increased, um, then we have to consider either type 1 diabetes or what's called LADA, which I'll talk about here next. And uh, those patients will often need insulin therapy. Um, often um, we have increased cardiovascular disease risk factors, so we're going to see increased cholesterol and lipids, uh, markers of systemic inflammation like uh, increased high sensitivity CRP, 
um, and uh, things like lipoprotein A, and so forth. All of these are markers, essentially uh, biomarkers for increased cardiovascular risk. Uh, the treatment for type 2 diabetes primarily, especially in the early to middle stages, depends on diet, exercise, and lifestyle. We'll talk about what those uh, suggestions should be. Uh, oral hypoglycemic agents, that would think be things like metformin, the sulfonylureas, uh, newer meds like the SGLT2s and GLP1s, we'll go over those in the treatment section, uh, and then late stages potentially insulin. Now, herbal therapy does have, uh, again, it's a debatable issue, but I've seen herbal therapy uh, to be very effective for uh, many type 2 patients, and so I'll be talking about some of those herbal regimens. Uh, in type 1, we're not going to see that herbal therapy has have as much of an effect because of the um, uh, destruction of the beta cells. Um, the insulin should be started in any patient, regardless if they we think they have type 2 or type 1, uh, who is in a catabolic uh, kind of cachexic state, so with weight loss, dehydration, hyperglycemia, or who has evidence of increased ketogenesis, uh, so ketouria or acidosis. Typically, if you have a patient in your office and they're non-fasting and you see a blood glucose of 400 milligrams per deciliter, uh, equal to or over 400, uh, they should be immediately sent to the emergency room uh, and they'll need to get that patient's blood sugar down through various means. They will often need to be hospitalized and get started on an insulin regimen uh, until they can get the, the blood sugars down. So um, just keep that number in mind. That's kind of our cutoff for when we should refer uh, for uh, urgent or emergency care. I mentioned another type of diabetes, much less common, uh, but we're seeing a little bit more of an increase in this. And uh, some people think that many type 2 patients are misdiagnosed as type 2 when they actually have LADA, which is latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. It's kind of like type 1 that develops more in an adult population. Um, this is caused by a delayed pancreatic autoimmunity, uh, but there's also components of insulin resistance as well. Um, it, this type shares genetic features of both type 1 and type 2, so some have referred to it as type 1.5 LADA. Um, it's a slower course of onset than the typical uh, juvenile onset type 1, um, so it's not going to be as, uh, you know, developing ketoacidosis and those kinds of things as quickly. Um, and uh, it's estimated that up to 50% of, uh, of persons with non-obesogenic type 2 diabetes actually have LADA. So for your thin patient who uh, presents with diabetes, maybe their physician has put them on oral hypoglycemic agents, uh, it might be useful to think about LADA. And the way we test for that is, again, seeing elevated blood glucose, decreased insulin, um, again, usually through measuring decreased C-peptide. And here, like type 1, we see the increased pancreatic autoantibodies. Um, so why, when would we think about measuring the autoantibodies in a type 2 patient? Well, if the, a, if the age of onset of diabetes is under 50, um, then we suspect there might be some degree of autoimmunity there, so we might want to go ahead and measure the antibodies. Um, if there are any acute symptoms, like any uh, signs or symptoms suggestive of diabetic ketoacidosis, and again, I'll go through the in detail what those are in the next set of slides. Um, that would be a criteria to measure the autoantibodies. A BMI of under 25, so a non-overweight or non-obese individual, uh, or any personal family history of autoimmune disease, and that could include autoimmune thyroiditis, celiac disease, etc. And then any thin patients with a poor response to metformin, sulfonylureas, consider LADA. Um, the treatment, um, initially patients usually respond to lifestyle changes and oral hypoglycemics. That improves the insulin resistance part of the equation. Um, but over time, they're going to probably need insulin. And um, so that's, um, again, we would treat that just like a type 1 diabetes patient. A another type of diabetes is MODI, and that's maturity onset diabetes of the young. Um, and this basically presents uh, in early life, typically, um, and it results from, there are several different types. There's over six different types of MODI with increased genetic uh, sensitivity testing and whatnot. We're finding more subtypes, but these all result from gene defects in beta cell function. Um, so um, basically there's a dysregulation in the glucose sensing or insulin secretion from the beta cells. 
Um, more than 50 have actually been identified. Again, clinically, we usually look at six or seven. Um, they increase, MODI will increase the risk of uh, type one or type two diabetes, depending on the type of MODI. And um, MODI one, I should say, is the most common. Okay, so MODI is basically non-insulin dependent diabetes diagnosed at a young age, so less than 25. Um, there's an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Uh, there's no autoantibodies, no insulin resistance. Patients are not obese and accounts for between up to 5%, so 2 to 5% of all diabetes cases. Uh, many patients with MODI are misclassified as having type 1 or type 2. So this is kind of when the patient doesn't have clear signs of auto uh, immunity, you know, to the beta cells. There's no real signs of insulin resistance. They're still diabetic. They have elevated blood glucose. Then MODI would be a, con a consideration. Uh, the six major subtypes we check, we look for, uh, or that are typically screened for clinically, um, would be MODI 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and each would have its unique genetic markers. And I've listed these out here for you um, and what the basic treatments are. So with MODI 1, typically the treatment would be with drugs like sulfonylureas, which are basically uh, going to tell the pancreas to secrete more insulin. And they're used primarily for type 2 diabetes. MODI 2 is treatment with diet. MODI 3 with sulfonylureas. We're not sure what MODI 4 responds to, and that's why I put a question mark there. Uh, MODI 5 and 6 are insulin dependent, but fortunately these are pretty rare. Um, so that's um, where, again, if you suspect a patient might have MODI, uh, probably the best course of action would be to send them to an endocrinologist who would be more up to date on the kind of current screening uh, and uh, genetic testing that would be, need to be done for this. Um, okay, so this testing will be performed in any patients when the suspicion is high. In other words, there's a familial type 2 di uh, familial diabetes, again, onset under 25, and negative pancreatic autoantibodies. Uh, it's often difficult to differentiate MODI from DM2 because we don't really have a direct test of insulin resistance per se, unlike we have with the autoantibody tests. Um, so. Again, this is where an expert might be consulted to see if um, they can kind of uh, narrow this down to if it's a specific type of MODI. So that's two less common types of diabetes, but two important types you should know about, LADA and the different types of MODI. Finally, of the most common types of diabetes, I'll talk about gestational diabetes, and this is glucose intolerance associated with pregnancy. It occurs in about 7% of all U.S. pregnancies. It's around 200,000 cases a year. Um, and uh, typically, we see some insulin resistance in pregnancy, which normally in, uh, resolves. Uh, we think this has to do with the uh, hormone variations as well as other factors secreted by the placenta during pregnancy. Uh, obesity increases the risk of gestational diabetes. And uh, women who develop gestational diabetes are then at higher risk after pregnancy uh, within the next 10 years of developing type 2 diabetes. The typical approach is to work with the diet lifestyle, um, but actually insulin is usually given because we need to really regulate the maternal blood sugar quickly. Uh, hyperglycemia in a pregnant woman will affect the fetus. And uh, this can result in all sorts of uh, birthing issues, as well as um, you know having a baby who is overweight, uh, and then is going to be actually going to be genetically and epigenetically programmed to uh, store weight later. And so there's a lot more complications with that. Um, so that's gestational diabetes developing during pregnancy. Less common types of diabetes. These would usually be diagnosed um, as different illnesses, which then have diabetes as a component. So uh, I just put the list here. There's a lot of uh, very uncommon genetic defects in insulin action. Um, we can have uh, exocrine and pancreatic disorders like pancreatitis and so forth, which can damage the beta cells. We talked about that in the pancreas section. Uh, various endocrinopathies like acromegaly, which is excess growth hormone secretion, uh, Cushing syndrome, excess cortisol, uh, hyperthyroidism, pheochromocytoma, that's increased uh, uh, epinephrine from the adrenal medulla or from chromaffin cells. Uh, glucagonoma, that's from an alpha cell secreting tumor, uh, secreting excess glucagon. Somatostatinoma and then aldosteronoma, 
in the adrenal cortex secreting excess aldosterone. So we would usually see these diagnosed as, you know, these endocrinopathies, and then they have a component of insulin resistance and diabetes as well. Um, I'll just say that acromegaly is a good example of why we do not want to inject growth hormone in adults. There has been a bit of a fad to use growth hormone injections to improve weight loss and things like that. Well, growth hormone uh, will induce insulin resistance and dramatically increase the risk of uh, insulin resistant diabetes. Uh, different drug and chemical induced diabetes, um, like um, different medication therapy, but glucocorticoids, uh, thyroid hormones, etc. cetera, uh, all of these would be associated. Now notice thiazide diuretics are on here and that's one concern about thiazides now is they're actually worsening insulin resistance. And so some uh, guideline committees like in the UK have actually taken thiazides off the list of primary medications for hypertension, uh, at least as the first line agents that we should use. Whereas in the US we still have them uh, for certain populations as first line agents. Um, there's a little concern that statin drugs also over time might actually worsen insulin resistance. Uh, and then um, a lot of our uh, beta blockers too over time, interestingly, also do that. So these would all be uh, medications of concern in some populations that we might want to think about. Uh, different infections like congenital rubella, cytomegalovirus can theoretically induce diabetes. Uh, here's more rare genetic syndromes and then um, uh, um, uh, uh, immune mediated types of diabetes as well. These don't need to be memorized in any way, but it's just important to know that these, sometimes you have to go down and look at the zebras when you've ruled out the other types of diabetes in your patients and um, they're not responding well to the therapies. Okay, so that's the overview of all the different types of diabetes. Now I mentioned that a precursor to type two diabetes essentially is insulin resistance. And that's when the cells fail to respond to the normal actions of insulin. And that could be problems at the insulin receptor or in the intracellular signaling pathways within the cell. Uh, but basically insulin is the insulin signal within the cell is, is not carried through. Um, and uh, this, can, this results typically in hyperinsulinemia as the beta cells hypersecrete insulin to try to stimulate the cells more and more uh, and it just is not working. Um, the um, beta cells, again, over time can become fibrosed and so forth, but typically if insulin resistance continues or worsens, uh, it will contribute to type 2 diabetes or uh, LADA. Um, the effects will vary depending on the target tissue. So in adipose, uh, insulin resistance will reduce the uptake of circulating lipids and um, increase the hydrolysis of stored triglycerides. So basically it increases your blood triglycerides. So that's when you'll see people with really, with insulin resistance, they typically have very elevated triglycerides. Now, triglycerides, typically anything over 150 milligrams per deciliter, we're concerned about. Clinically, uh, we get much more concerned when it's over 500 milligrams per deciliter and definitely over 1,000 milligrams per deciliter. That can dramatically increase the risk for pancreatitis. So those are patients we try to be very aggressive with the medications with at that point. But typically, you know, uh, triglycerides at 200, 250, um, this would be a pretty characteristic finding in patients with insulin resistance. In your skeletal muscles, myocytes, um, the insulin resistance will cause decreased uptake of glucose, uh, decreased muscle glycogen, and uh, so the muscles will just not function uh, adequately. Um, interestingly, one of the most important things we can do to improve insulin utilization in the tissues is exercise. So when we exercise, that actually improves the skeletal muscle uptake of uh, insulin as well as glucose and dramatically drops blood glucose. The clinical presentation of insulin resistance varies and typically we'll just see you know, on the blood tests and the blood work, the A1C ranges, for example, that a person is insulin resistant. Uh, but they can include things like very generic symptoms like CNS, like brain fogginess, poor concentration, depression. We'll see the elevated blood sugar and triglycerides. Uh, but things like intestinal bloating, sleepiness after meals, weight gain, can increase fat storage. Uh, increased blood pressure, and then a characteristic darkening where there are folds in the skin called acanthosis nigricans. That's a pretty common finding. You'll see that under the arms, maybe under the breasts, things like that. Um, in a more traditional, like Chinese medicine perspective, we'd say there's increased phlegm uh, 
this is a phlegm, uh, tissue phlegm kind of pattern. Uh, so that's all insulin resistance. Now, insulin resistance often goes along with metabolic syndrome. I mentioned this before, metabolic syndrome is a, kind of an epidemic now. Um, and the big problem with metabolic syndrome is in addition to increasing your risk of developing type 2 diabetes, it dramatically increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, so there are many risk factors. Um, genetics is one, um, and uh, that's having a family history of type 2 diabetes. Uh, age over 45, so the uh, risk increases with age, and then obesity, especially visceral and central obesity. Um, those are not always uh, modifiable risk factors, especially the age and genetics, but we do know that lifestyle plays a big role into this, so having high saturated fats um, and decreased uh, omega-3 fats, especially in the context of a high carbohydrate, especially high glycemic index food diet. So high sugar, high saturated fat diet seems to dramatically worsen. And we know that's of course a risk factor for cardiovascular disease as well. Um, just high caloric intake in general. And then potentially, you know, high calorie foods with low nutrients. So deficient in vitamin D, a lot of trace elements and so forth, we suspect that might also be an issue. Uh, physical inactivity and then stress plays a role. Uh, we don't know if it's just kind of incidental or if it's an actual direct causative role, but definitely elevations we see in different hormones. Uh, elevations of cortisol, HPA axis activation dramatically seems to increase the risk of uh, metabolic syndrome. Low melatonin states. Uh, in fact, uh, we know that uh, night shift working will cause dramatically lowered melatonin, even the person's getting eight hours of sleep during the day. And the WHO has actually lifted, listed night shift work now um, as a known carcinogen because uh, we know that melatonin um, is a potent antioxidant and is very helpful as a cancer protective agent. Um, we also think that night shift working has, is associated with increased insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. Um, so that's the melatonin role. Low thyroid, so hypothyroidism or subclinical hypothyroidism. Um, the liver, interestingly, when it becomes filled with uh, too much triglyceride, like in fatty liver, will secrete hormones called uh, hepatokines. And uh, these will essentially induce insulin resistance in the periphery. Uh, decreased levels of DHEA from your adrenal cortex, and then elevated estrogen, decreased progesterone and testosterone. All of these are um, neuroendocrine correlations with uh, insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. We know that many of these endocrine imbalances result in systemic inflammation with increased TNF-alpha, IL-1 and 6, and then potentially mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, now, interestingly, uh, patients with uh, certain types of bariatric surgery, especially the uh, gastric bypass surgery, where the uh, portion of the stomach is bypassed, the duodenum is bypassed, um, and the stomach is directly attached to the jejunum. Uh, when you bypass the duodenum, um, Interestingly, many of these patients who were insulin resistant before the surgery immediately lose that resistance and they become insulin sensitive again after the surgery. So we think there might be duodenal proteins that are secreted that are inducing insulin resistance. And by bypassing the duodenum, um, that is improving. So uh, these, this would be some of those gastrointestinal hormones like uh, cholecystokinin, uh, GLP-1, GIP, and so forth. And um, so that's one other potential factor here. The definition of metabolic syndrome, just so we know, this, there's several agencies who have defined this. So the International Diabetes Federation, uh, the US NCEP, and American Heart Association um, basically all say that we need at least three out of the following five criteria. So uh, this glycemia, so fasting blood glucose over 100, or previously diagnosed type 2 diabetes. Remember, type 2 is uh, equal to over 126. Um, so 100 to 125 is pre-diabetes. So having dysglycemia, central obesity. So if the BMI is over 30, we can just assume their central obesity. Um, but under 30, we look at waist circumference. So in males, if the waist is over 40 inches, if it's over 35 in females, that is the criteria for central obesity. Um, having low HDL, so less than 40 uh, milligrams per deciliter in males or less than 50 in females. This is your protective cholesterol lipoprotein. And then uh, having high serum triglycerides over 150. Um, and then finally, 
hypertension uh, over 130 over 85, or if a patient's taking a medication for hypertension, we can just assume they have hypertension. Um, other guidelines, the AHA is a little more strict. They use this lower level, 130 over 85. The other guideline committees use uh, 140 over 90 as the cutoff, but you know, very similar. Um, so basically, any three having three out of five of these uh, qualifies as metabolic syndrome. Um, so there is um, definitely with these markers, we know this increase for cardiovascular disease. And uh, so we'll typically see elevations in the cardiovascular biomarkers, as I mentioned before, like HSCRP, LP little a, fibrinogen. We don't typically measure those. Uh, I won't go over when they have a role. Basically, just very quickly, we can use for primary prevention, the ASCVD risk calculator for those patients between 40 and 79. And uh, we can see if they are um, sort of in a, you know, if they have an, uh, an ASCVD risk score, you know, above 5.5 or 7.5% uh, and maybe up to 15% or so, then we can use these biomarkers to help stratify who we need to be more aggressive at doing lipid lowering with and so forth. But um, we don't typically measure these biomarkers except in that select population. Um, so that's the criteria for metabolic syndrome, and uh, that's a basic overview of insulin resistance. And the next uh, series of videos will talk about the complications of diabetes and then jump into assessment and treatment.